Hello everyone, welcome to the 180 Jury Charge in Literary. We're going to start off with some legal terms and then I'm going to read you the paragraphs. So you're going to hear testimony, initial T, final M, exhibit, X-I-B-T, like a squeeze, hearsay, H-A-E-R-S, and then document. You can write document in one stroke, D-O-M-T. All right, here we go. Ready? Oh, you're also going to hear mark for identification, which can be written as MOID, M-O-I-D, MOID. Ready? Testimony and exhibits are introduced in a case to prove certain facts. Testimony is given by witnesses and may include opinions, facts, and inferences. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence. Documents and tangible items are presented in the court as exhibits. Exhibits that are accepted by the court are marked for identification and may be received in evidence. Hearsay evidence may be permitted in court. At the close of the case, counsel may give closing arguments. The jury charge is given to the jury by the judge. The jury must then examine and weigh the evidence that was presented in the case. Okay. Moving right along to some literary and the subject is bankruptcy. Ready? A debtor may wish to seek release from the liability of payment for his debts. This may be accomplished by initiating voluntary bankruptcy proceedings. The petition for bankruptcy is granted if the court finds that the debtor is unable to pay his debts. Most states require the debtor to submit a complete accounting of his assets and liabilities. Some states also require the financial background on persons closely associated with the debtor, his wife, children, business partner, etc. In the bankruptcy proceedings, the court will closely supervise the liquidation of all assets. Some states permit the debtor to retain certain assets if it can be proven that they are necessary for daily living. The court will recognize the claims by priority as follows. First, several claims such as mortgages. Second, priority claims such as taxes. And third, unsecured claims. Bankruptcy is a legal discharge from debts, but a moral obligation remains. The debtor will find that his credit standing is ruined. In most states, the debtor is required to wait anywhere from 3 to 10 years before reestablishing his former credit standing. Okay. I'm going to read to you some legal opinion and arguments. Okay, here we go. Ready? All right, now shortly before the colloquy that appears on those pages of the Huntington Center's Points and Authorities, Mr. Penwell testified, and this is on page 32 of these depositions, I can see these depositions have been logged with the court, that they had negotiated branch offices for Coast in various other places, such as Walnut Creek, California, which is some 500 miles away, Diamond Bar out in the Pomona area, West Covina, San Gabriel Valley, and Long Beach. All right, I will let counsel inquire into the fact that Mr. Penwell had conducted these negotiations for branch sites because I thought it had limited relevancy to the man's capabilities and his background and so forth and so on. Then counsel wanted to get into the negotiation of the terms and provisions of each of these leases, whether Coast engaged a broker and what they told the broker and what they instructed the broker. I submit, Your Honor, this is just too far afield. I mean, we could go on forever in these depositions on that basis. So I think questions 1 to 7 respecting the negotiation by Mr. Penwell of these other branch sites having nothing to do with Huntington Center or Huntington Beach or negotiations of other branch sites within 30 miles of Huntington Center. It is just, you know, so much absurdity in context of this particular suit. All right, now let's go and let's go on to the questions 8 through 55. It seems to me, Your Honor, these can be treated as one group. These appear at pages 27A to 27W of the points and authorities filed by the Huntington Center. And then also question 60, which is on page 30A, I think, belongs in this group. 
Now these all deal, Your Honor, with the question of why Coast and relocating its branch from Huntington Center to the Edinger Plaza location chose to move the Edinger Plaza rather than to come other come to some other alternative location. Now among those things, there are a series of questions asked to which officers participated in the decision to use Edinger Plaza, why that site was chosen among various alternatives, Mr. Penwell's conversations with officers as to why that site was chosen. It has nothing to do, as I pointed out earlier, with any anti-competitive motivation assuming that that can conceivably be an issue. But again, the fact is they moved out of the Huntington Center and what rights that may give Huntington Center depends upon the interpretation of the lease and upon the application of the lease and why, when it chose to move out, it chose location A rather than B, C, or D. It seems to me, again, if these questions are permitted to be asked, of Mr. Penwell, we're going to have five more rounds of these questions going on by the end of May. I think it is a useless kind of discovery. Question 56 on page 28A. Now that question was answered, and I don't know why the motion was made. Mr. Penwell was asked when he became aware of Coast's decision to relocate, and there is a specific answer to that question. Question 57 was not answered, but it seems to me that was an incomplete question because there was colloquy developed in the middle of that question, and the question was never completed. Now, the last two questions, I don't have the number of them now, but on pages 29A and 29B, Mr. Penwell is asked of what other savings and loans or competitors of Coast he is aware of within a three-mile radius of Huntington Center. Again, Your Honor, that goes to the so-called anti-competitive desire, belief, attitude, motive, which I don't think is an issue in this case. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. My next article here is covering patents and copyrights. Here we go. Ready? A substantial number of individuals, businesses, and corporations find it necessary to secure patents or copyrights. A patent is the registered right of the inventor to make, use, and sell his invention. A patent is valid for a period of 17 years. The patent application should be filled out carefully. There is a small filing fee which must accompany the application. A suit for patent infringement by any by another may be brought. Such suits are costly and time-consuming. However, if an infringement can be proved, monetary damages and an injunction are available. A copyright is the registered right of an author, composer, designer, or artist to reproduce, publish, and sell their works, books, music, art, and other original material, which are the result of the skill and intelligence of the creator. Copyrights are granted for a period of 28 years and may be renewed for a second 28-year period. The holder of a copyright may sue anyone for damages who violates that copyright. Copyrights may be held by individuals or by a company such as a publishing company. All right. I'm going to read you a paragraph and you're going to hear legal terms uh, such as verdict, V-E-R-D, request, K-W on the initial side, innocent, initial N, final N-T, uh, jury, which I write as J-U-R. Okay. You're, oh, you're also going to hear jury room and I write that J-U-R-M and it does not conflict with germ because it's J-U-R-M. All right, here we go. Ready? When the jury retires to the jury room, they are sequestered from the public. At this time, the jury will begin their deliberations. When the jury reaches a verdict, they return to the courtroom. Normally, the foreman of the jury will read the verdict. 
either attorney may request that the jury be polled. A jury that is unable to reach a verdict is called a hung jury. There are two possible verdicts, innocent and guilty. An acquittal is when the person is found innocent of the charges. If both of the attorneys agree, a non-jury trial may be stipulated. All right. This next article is on proprietorship. Ready? A sole proprietorship is the name applied to a business that is owned and operated by a single person. The sole proprietorship is the oldest form of business organization, dating back to Carpenters, Millers, Smiths, Wrights, Coopers, Plumbers, and Clarks. A proprietor furnishes all the capital for the business. He must assume all the risks and all of the losses. He must pay all of the debts and be responsible for all of the decision making. The proprietor is entitled to receive all of the profits of the business and he also holds title to all of the business assets. A sole proprietorship is well suited to a small scale business. In fact, the vast majority of American businesses are proprietorships. Okay, I'm going to continue on with Martin Luther King. And we are on Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SL, or excuse me, SCLC. Ready? In 1957, King, Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, Joseph Lowry, and other civil rights activists founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, other otherwise known as SCLC. The group was created to harness the moral authority and organizing power of black churches to conduct nonviolent protests in the service of civil rights reform. King led the SCLC until his death. King believed that organized nonviolent protest against the system of Southern segregation now now as, or excuse me, no, as Jim Crow laws would lead to extensive media coverage of the struggle for black equality and voting rights. Journalistic accounts and televised footage of the daily deprivation and indignities suffered by Southern blacks and of segregation violence and harassments of civil rights workers and marchers produced a wave of sympathetic public opinion that convinced the majority of Americans that the civil rights movement was the most important issue in American politics in the early 1960s. King organized and led marches for blacks' right to vote, segregation, labor rights, and other basic civil rights. Most of these rights were successfully inactive into the law of the United States with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Assassination and its Aftermath The Lorraine Motel, where King was assassinated, is now the site of the National Civil Rights Museum. On March 29, 1968, King went to Memphis, Tennessee, in support of the Black Sanitary Public Works employees, represented by AFS CME Local 777, who had been on strike since March 12 for higher wages and better treatment. In one incident, Black Street repairmen received pay for two hours when they were sent home because of bad weather, but white employees were paid for the full day. On April 3rd, King addressed a rally and delivered his I've Been to the Mountaintop address at Mason Temple, the world headquarters of the Church of God in Christ. King's flight to Memphis had been delayed by a bomb threat against his plane. In the close of the last speech of his career, in reference to the bomb threat, King said the following, And then I got to Memphis and some began to say the threats or talk about the threats that were out. What would happen to me for some of our sick white brothers? Well, I don't know what will happen now. 
We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we, as a people, will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes, or my eyes, have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. King was booked in room 306 at the Lorraine Motel, owned by Walter Bailey in Memphis. Then at 6.01 p.m. April 4th, 1968, a shot rang out as King stood on the motel's second floor balcony. The bullet entered his right cheek, smashing his jaw, then traveling down his spine cord before lodging in his shoulder. Abernathy heard the shot from inside the motel room and ran to the balcony to find King on the floor. After emergency chest surgery, King was pronounced dead at St. Joseph's Hospital at 7.05 p.m. And then now we're on to legacy. King's main legacy was to secure progress on civil rights in the U.S. Just days after King's assassination, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1968. The Title VIII of the Act, commonly known as the Fair Housing Act, prohibited discrimination in housing and housing-related transactions on the basis of race, religion, or national origin, later expanded to include sex, familial status, and disability. This legislation was seen as a tribute to King's struggle in his final years to combat residential discrimination in the U.S. King's wife, Coretta Scott King, followed in her husband's footsteps and was active in matters of social justice and civil rights until her death in 2006. Martin Luther King Jr. Day At the White House Rose Garden on November 2, 1983, President Ronald Reagan signed a bill creating a federal holiday to honor King. Observed for the first time on January 20, 1986, it is called Martin Luther King, or excuse me, Martin Luther Jr. Day. Following President George H.W. Bush's 1992 proclamation, the holiday is observed on the third Monday of January of each year, near the time of King's birthday. Awards and Recognition On October 14, 1964, King became the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, which was awarded to him for leading nonviolent resistance to racial prejudice in the U.S. More than 700 cities in the United States have streets named after King. In 1980, the U.S. Department of the Interior designated King's Boyhood Home in Atlanta and several nearby buildings the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site. King was the first African-American and the fourth non-president honored with his own memorial in the National Mall area. The memorial opened in August 2011 and is administered by the National Park Service. Okay. I'm going to read... Some jury charge. Back to jury charge. Here we go. Ready? Members of the jury, now I have said that you must consider all of the evidence. This does not mean, however, that you must accept all of the evidence as true or accurate. You are the sole judges of the credibility or believability of each witness and the weight to be given to his or her testimony. In weighing the testimony of a witness, you should consider his or her relationship to the plaintiff or to the defendant, his or her interest, if any, in the outcome of the case, his or her manner of testifying, his or her opportunity to observe or acquire knowledge concerning the facts about which he or she testified, his or her candor, fairness, and intelligence, 
and the extent to which he or she has been supported or contradicted by other credible evidence. You may, in short, accept or reject the testimony of any witness, in whole or in part. Also, the weight of the evidence is not necessarily determined by the number of witnesses testifying as to the existence or non-existence of any fact. You may find that the testimony of a smaller number of witnesses as to any fact is more credible than the testimony of a larger number of witnesses to the contrary. Okay, and that concludes our jury charge and literary for the 180 class. Have a great day.